Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. from every nation. Wonderful. It's nice to be here with you. Now, um, a small apology. Um, last week, when I spoke about the beginnings uh, of the creation, I spoke as though that was the way it actually happened. There's not enough detail for us to be adamant about how or when and over how long a period before it took place. There are numerous other theories of how and when, uh, which are based on geological and archaeological and astronomical uh, evidence. There are also some very highly respected evangelical teachers that teach that the earth is not much older than Adam's bones. The Hebrew nation also has a calendar. Uh, November 2020 is actually Chislev 5871 AM. That means Anno Muni, the year of the world. And so they think the world is 5,871 years old. So that's commencing from Adam until now. We in Christian grace need to respect and love anyone that God loved enough to give his son to die for, um, for their salvation. We are not to hate anyone who is of another or an opposite persuasion, even when they hate us, because they are not our servants or subjects. When we get to heaven and we're all still curious about it, we will find out. Just want to remind you of a of an incident where um, the young lady, lecturer, asked the student, if she really believed that Jonah was swallowed by a whale and survived it. She said that when she gets to heaven, she'll ask him. And the teacher said, what if he's not there? She said, then you can ask him. <laughs> I, I don't think I'll, I'll finish everything I've prepared for today, and so whatever is over, I'll leave for another moment. Um, in Paul's debate about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter is about resurrection. And uh, he tells us how Christ lived, died, was buried, rose again, and so on, and he was seen by over 500 people at one time. Those were probably the disciples who shouted Hosanna when he was coming in to Jerusalem. Uh, now, um, the, the, the turning point in the debate about is there resurrection or not was verse 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. And this is how you're supposed to read that verse. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. If you turn in there. It's a short verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and some verses have to be read in a special way, like in Isaiah 52, but he was wounded for our transgressions. That's the way to read it. Now this verse is to be read like this. Remember, there's a debate, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen? Amen? This guarantees our eternal life. And there's a verse in Romans 5, verse 10, which, which shows that. Um, Romans 5, 10. For if we were enemy, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death, of, by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so our salvation and our eternal life depends on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the greatest work God on, did on earth, was to raise Jesus from the dead when he was actually being made a sacrifice for all our sin. The sin of the whole world was laid on him. And the miracle was that he had paid enough, and much more than enough. 
And so God was justified in raising him from the dead and putting him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So um, there's a very well-researched book called The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. <clears throat> and uh, Daniel's 69 weeks started with Nehemiah being sent to rebuild Jerusalem, 445 BC, until triumphal entry on a, a donkey, April the 3rd, AD 33, allowing for all the calendar errors of the Jews and the Romans. It, uh, the 483 years ended on the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, his triumphal entry. And so you find that in Matthew 21, uh, quite a detailed episode. <clears throat> now, I will read one verse of the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 9. I'll read verse 24. It actually gives the huge agenda for the 70 weeks. And I'll, I'll read it carefully. <clears throat> and there's two special words, a few special words. Thy people, thy holy city. Let's go. Daniel 9 verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish, this is the agenda, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The Lord adds his blessing to the reading of the word. This is Daniel 9, 24. It's actually from 23 to the end of the chapter uh, about the 70 weeks and how they divided into uh, 7 and um, 62 and then another week somewhere. And so we have Daniel 70 weeks. Please note that only one of the items in the Jewish agenda in verse 24 was paid for at Calvary. That is, after the seven and the 62 weeks, uh, 483 years, only the reconciliation for iniquity was prepared. As far as the Jewish nation was concerned, that's the only thing that was dealt with at Calvary. Um, the price for reconciliation was paid, but the whole thing waits, the rest of the agenda waits for the 70th week, because this has to do with the Jewish people. As far as we are concerned, the price is paid, we are free, we have eternal life by his resurrection. But as far as the Jewish nation is concerned, that agenda is still not finished. They have to wait for that 70th week. So uh, we've come to the end of the dispensation of law when Jesus arrived and uh, we here we have uh, law, this dispensation of law. This is the um, captivity of Judah, 606. And then you have the return of Judah. Remember, Israel is gone and dispersed in among the nations, but Judah, Benjamin, and some Levites returned back to Jerusalem. Um, and uh, the seven, uh, seven weeks um, are the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and then the 69 weeks is till Messiah shall be cut off. And here we have uh, the cross, of Calvary, the central thing in God's plan with mankind. And here we have judgment number one. It ends the dispensation of law and we, be, we come to the dispensation of grace. We find that Jesus Christ has paid the debt for all men. He's buried and he's raised from the dead and he releases the captives and takes them to the paradise above. And um, now we go to two other parables as we go into the ecclesiastical dispensation. This is the dispensation of the church. We also call it the dispensation of Christ. This is the time 
after Pentecost where the Holy Spirit's available to help you and me to come to the cross of Calvary and confess our sinfulness and place our debt in his hands to be paid completely and for our sins to be washed away whiter than the snow. And the Holy Spirit's here to do that and help us and to put new life in our heart as um, he changes us. But I want you to look at two parables first. There's a parable, or two parables of, of many in, in Matthew 13. There's one, the parable of a great treasure, a treasure. This precious treasure was found by somebody in a field, and for the joy of it, he bought that field for everything he had. And then he reburied the treasure. And then we have another thing in the next parable is a pool of great price, which he buy, bought with all he had. The great treasure is Israel. The father bought that with everything he had, his son. The pool of great price is the church. And that comes to be owned and kept. And he gave, his son gave everything he had for that pool of great price. You and I are part of that great treasure. Strangely, it was never mentioned in the Old Testament. And uh, it's not mentioned in, uh, very clearly in the Old Testament prophecy, uh, but it becomes very prominent for 2,000 years. Um, uh, and the ministry is exposed by the Apostle Paul and Peter and it's a mystery that's been hidden through the ages. In other words, the word is, it was secret until now and God revealed it to Peter and Paul uh, and John. Uh, now we can go to Colossians 1 verse 27 and I will read it. The church uh, when you come to a, a Greek word like mysteria, it means something that hasn't been known until now. And here we have Matthew, Colossians 1, uh, 26 and so on. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit had been with people, had addressed some individuals, but he never was in them. Samson lost him and he regained it. And then uh, Saul, the spirit was taken away from him. David, the spirit was with him. And he prayed that the Lord wouldn't take his spirit away. And so this is a mystery that comes in the New Testament because Christ has died and paid. The spirit comes to live in us and he doesn't depart. And our salvation is secure and sure. And this is a good time for a lesson. This mystery is about people finding out they're sinners and confessing this to God the Father and trusting in the death of Jesus Christ for the removal of their sin. The next thing in this mystery is that they become children of God um, and His Holy Spirit lives inside them. Have you ever come to that point in your life when you confess to the Father your sinfulness and told him of your desire to be washed in the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. If you're not, if not, you're not included in this mystery church. If you haven't come to Jesus for salvation, you're not part of the church. Um, and then when the church is taken away, you'll be left in the crowd without the Holy Spirit, without the church, and the place will be in chaos. And uh, you'll be among God's enemies who are facing Israel and their angry God. This is another period 
not the church period, it's after the church period. So be sure that you have Jesus in your heart, that you are a child of God. In that time, any dissident will not be saved. He will have his head cut off. And if you can't trust now, if you can't trust Christ now, you won't be able to then, because the Holy Spirit won't be there to give you the second birth. And uh, so, uh, if you need any help, anybody, bless, um, just ask us and we can help you. And um, at the end of the dispensation of grace, uh, which we can have a look at now, this is the dispensation of grace. Um, mystery form of the kingdom, I've described the church, and you see here, this is the church, the pearl of great price. But what's happened to the treasure? The treasure has been dispersed among the nations, and there was not even a nation of Israel until 1948. And the next dealings of God with them needs them at home in Jerusalem. Praise God. They came back, the two nations of Judah and Benjamin and, and, um, and Levi, they come back and the others will also be drawn in somehow. We don't know where they are, they're all over the world and some people say they've gone, they don't exist anymore, but God knows where they are and he can bring them back for his service because he's named 12 tribes um, who are going to be uh, providing missionaries for the Jewish people and the rest of the world during this time of great trouble. Now, judgment number three. I'm sorry, we must have a look at the, the, the church age here. There's the church age, and that's called the fullness of the Gentiles. And when the fullness of the Gentiles comes, we go away. The church goes away. And um, up to heaven to be with the Lord, and we've read that a few times this morning already, how um, that happens. And uh, so the church is taken away by the shout, by the voice of the trumpet, and uh, the voice of the archangel. Now, we can move from this here into the next, the second, second advent, or judgment number three. This is called the tribulation. It's the, the judgment will be at the hand of the Antichrist. Um, the person Satan proposes as the false messiah who brings peace out of the chaos. And they look up to him and they are fooled by him. The, the beast or Antichrist who has a fatal wound and dies but is resurrected is assisted by a false prophet appointed by Satan, that old serpent or dragon. Between them, they form the false trinity, faking the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And um, they perform amazing signs and wonders and fool most of the nations, including part of Israel. The beast makes a seven-year um, treaty with Israel. This is in Daniel's um, chapter 9, uh, and imposes... He, he makes a seven-year treaty with Israel, allowing them to make, to worship at their temple, making sacrifices according to Moses' law. After three and a half years of this period, time and times and a dividing of time, three and a half years, the beast terminates that um, treaty and imposes a living statue that can speak at the temple for them to worship. And this is the abomination mentioned by Daniel and Jesus. Those in Jerusalem were warned by Jesus to flee to the desert. Uh, I won't give the details of the, uh, the Great Tribulation. The second half of the seven year period is called the Great Tribulation, where there's a mark of the beast uh, which Marlon spoke about last year. Just know that the mark of the beast is required on your person, on your hand or your forehead, to permit you to buy or sell or to live in public. And some people wouldn't even be able to get a cup of water. And those who don't want to take the mark will have a hard time. And those who 
don't help them will be the goats, and those who do help them will be the sheep. And I think those are nations, not individuals. So we come to this end of the Great Tribulation, which I haven't given much detail of. Uh, then comes the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what the book is actually called, the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John. Revelation 19 says at the end of the seven years, Daniel 70th week, Jesus returns to earth on a white horse with his righteous saints all on white horses. Um, we've been away for a while up in heaven. And uh, um, as he touches down on the Mount of Olives, uh, the mountain splits in two and uh, the Jews see him whom they pierced and they repent and in their separate tribes and husbands and wives apart, they mourn about Jesus according to Zechariah chapter 12, especially verse 10 and the whole context of that Zechariah 12. The King of Kings comes to have victory using natural elements like 50 kilogram hailstones, 50 kilograms, a 25 kilogram bucket this big, 50 kilograms is twice that big. That's the size of the hailstones. Uh, uses 50 kilogram, 100 pound hailstones and burning sulfur and the word of his mouth. And uh, this is the day of Christ and the day of vengeance of our God, which Jesus read at Nazareth, remember? I've come to proclaim um, uh, peace and uh, uh, comfort and the day of vengeance of our God. But before we read day of vengeance, he closed the book because that wasn't why he came that time. This time he comes to declare the day of vengeance of our God. This is the time mentioned by the Lord when there'll be signs in the heavens, uh, the sun and the moon and the stars. We don't need to look for blood moons now. <laughs> Those are signs of the coming to earth of the Son of Man, not the coming to the air. And so don't worry about um, that. Remember the seven seals Marlon spoke about and the seven um, trumpets and the seven vials and the four woes. Those all have to happen still and they come and they punish Israel and the nations. And so this is the day of vengeance of our God. Um, at the, and now we come to the end of the 70th week. We come to judgment number four. Judgment number four. At the end of the 70th week, there's a fourth judgment. Uh, we've had the first judgment. The saints were judged. The, the saints' sins, yours and mine, were judged at the cross of Calvary. Judgment number three, Israel is judged for their unbelief because they said his, ble his blood be upon our head. And now judgment number four, at the end of the 70th week, there's a fourth judgment where the Gentile nations are judged according to their treatment of the persecuted Jewish martyrs, according to Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. These are nations put on the right hand side of God Nations put on the left hand side of God, the sheep are rewarded and they survive and the goats are destroyed. Satan the dragon is chained up and placed in the bottomless pit. And the other two, the Antichrist, the beast and the false prophet, they go to the lake of fire. The, uh, the goat nations are put to death by fire from heaven. Their bodies go to the grave, their souls go to hell, and so there are now no unbelievers left on earth. Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and this introduces the millennial, millennial age. So there you have uh, judgment number three and judgment number four, and we go into the millennial dispensation. Now, um, we've shown how Israel has being brought back so that the Lord can deal with them in Jerusalem at the time of the 70th week of Daniel. Um, now, you may be wondering, is something missing? 
Judgment number two. Okay. Um, we meet the Lord in the air. We've read it three, four times this morning. Uh, judgment number two. The saints appear before the judgment seat of Christ for their rewards and awards. Um, we sang in the sands of time, not at the crown he giveth, but at his pierced hand. We're going to get crowns somewhere. Um, um, some will get many crowns. Uh, there's at least seven kinds of crowns being handed out. And so we be, this is judgment number two, the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, that's uh, in Second Corinthians 5 and it's also in Romans 14. Romans 14, the judgment seat of Christ. We all have to appear before him. And um, he's the one who's going to judge. And uh, we'll be reporting on our service for him. Good stuff will survive. Bad stuff will be burnt up. Whatever we did will be tested by motives. Why we did what we did? Was it for a crown? Or was it to serve the Lord we love? Was it for myself to gain disciples? Or was it to save the souls of men? What, whatever our motive was, it will be judged. And I think a proud man's success will be worth a lot less than a humble man's apparent failure. And he will give to some a well done and a laurel wreath. And to some proud men, perhaps he'll say, come inside. And he'll introduce some to his father and say, this is my servant, John, or whoever. So we should lay up treasure in heaven. Here's another lesson. We should lay up treasure in heaven so that when our deeds are judged, whether they be gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, will we be smelling of smoke? Or will we go in with a wreath, a crown? Remember, it's not a diadem of a king. It's just a um, Stephanos of the athlete and so let's make sure that we each one make sure that we are one of the few jesus said few there be that find it what else did he say he said there be many great preachers saying lord we preached in your name we, we did miracles in your name in your name we cast our demons. And you'll say, get out. I never knew you. And so let us see that we lay up treasure in heaven. Uh, what will we bring? What will you or I bring to Jesus on the day to be rewarded for? Have we served the Lord faithfully? Have we kept his great commandment to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Will I be empty handed when I get there? Will I have nothing to give him? Not a friend, a colleague, parent, child, uh, a staff member, or an employee, or an employer? Have I brought anybody to Jesus? Will I come empty handed? What a terrible thing to do, coming empty handed. Will we start now obeying that command, going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? That's the judgment seat of Christ. After that, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Uh, the church is his bride, and the bride arrives pure and spotless and introduced to his father, and the wedding feast begins. 
Meanwhile, down on earth, it's that seven years has begun some time after we arrived there, don't know how long, but some time after that seven years uh, of the last week of, of uh, the Jewish calendar uh, takes place. And uh, so there we, we've had a wedding feast of lamb. I haven't given you much detail because we haven't got much detail. It's just the wedding feast. And so it cannot be imagined what a wonderful time that's going to be. This is um, there. And now we just go forward again to the millennium. Um, and the millennium is this thousand years here. Um, uh, at the end of this peaceful time, this is a time when Jesus reigns in Jerusalem. Ah, what's happened here? At the end of judgment number three, the martyrs, the Jewish martyrs, will be resurrected and they'll come back with Jesus to reign with him in the millennial kingdom. Israel will see their saviour that they rejected. I think it was because blindness is put on them. They rejected the Savior and they see him whom they pierced and they mourn for him. And they will accept him and he will be their king and he will be ruling in Jerusalem and the world will come to Jerusalem with presents and prizes to the Jewish people and people will brag, oh, I know a Jewish man. His name is... And, and it will be something else to be a Jewish person at that time and to even know one. And uh, they will be the leaders during this thousand years. Death and the tears won't be there. And um, a person of a hundred years old, hundred years old, be considered a kid at that time. Um, now we come to the end of the millennium because we had a gallop through. At the end of the millennium, <coughs> where's Satan? He's in the bottom of this pit. He's released for a little while to test the nations. And some nations, believe it or not, are believing in him. And they mount an attack on Jerusalem. And um, the Lord destroys them by the word of his mouth. Then Satan is taken and he's sent into the lake of fire and the Bible says where the beast and the false prophet are. Still alive, still suffering and the suffering goes on forever and ever. Now, everything's pushed aside and there's a great white throne judgment. And Jesus tests everybody who hasn't got to heaven yet. The demons have been cast into the into the, the lake of fire. The people whose names are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life are cast into the lake of fire. Let's say it again: the Book of Life. If your name's not in the book of life, you're cast into the lake of fire. But books were opened, it says. Books were opened. We heard slightly this morning that our lives have all been recorded. Everybody's life has been recorded before they lived their life. And those books will be opened. The books of our conscience, the, or their conscience. I'm not here, I'm in heaven. Um, but those books will be opened and everything that God knows about you and me, they're not paper books, but in his own missions. And those books are opened and uh, they will be judged. And whoever's name is not in the book of life, I think your name is put in the book when you're born. And there comes a time when God blots it out. And if your name is not, in the book of life, 
you can blot it out and you cast into the lake of fire that burneth forever and ever. So Satan is sent there and this heaven and earth is put one side and the great judgment takes place. Then we come to the heading here, regeneration. Um, ages of the ages. And here we have the word in Peter and Revelation 21. Um, the earth is cleansed with fire and prepared for the new Jerusalem. Um, not much detail, just that there's no more sea. Not the only detail. And um, there's a new Jerusalem and God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are there. And I don't know if there's sun or moon, but they're not needed in Jerusalem because God is the temple. There's no temple. God is the temple. No need for sun or moon. God is the light. What happens on the, the earth will probably have the sun the day and night. We don't know. But um, so that is God living among us. And so um, it's called the perfect earth and the period is called the eternal state, which goes on eternally. So there we've rushed through and uh, uh, we've been through the dispensational ages. And one of the things described in Jerusalem, the new world, is that a new Jerusalem comes down and it's square, his gates, the details of the gates and uh, uh, so on. But um, that is in the new earth which the Lord has prepared for us. And so that's a quick gallop through, uh, the, through the ages of the ages and the dispensational truth. You can find these in Larkin's charts.com and uh, Will has found another website where you can get all his charts free uh, and if you're interested in it just do that and get to know what how God dealt with men before and during the time of the church um, age uh, and during the various dispensations here we are at the moment I believe we're right near the end of the uh, of the church age or the um, uh, period of grace. If you know anybody who's not saved, work on them, especially if you love them. Even if you don't love them, work on them and see whether you can bring them to your knowledge of Jesus Christ and to repentance and salvation in Jesus Christ. But the time's very short. Israel's already there. They're already in trouble. They've just assassinated or somebody has just assassinated uh, the, the, the chief nuclear scientist in Persia, Iran. And this is prophesied by, um, by um, Rosenberg in 1913 in one of his books, you know, Damascus. Um, it was well, called the book's name starts at Damascus. And he's there, got the name of the man in the book in 1913. And he's assassinated because of his position in the nuclear nuclear thing, and yet it happened two days ago. He was assassinated in Iran with a great security and all broken in. And so things are happening now. We don't need science. Israel's already there to tell us. And um, Israel's already in trouble. And the America has no government at the moment. And so we see chaos coming and we see the signs that Jesus is coming to take us away and the Holy Spirit so that he can carry on with the, the plan of the ages and get into the judgment seat of Christ, the wedding of the Lamb, the judgment of Israel, the judgment of the nations. So let's be on our guard, be not asleep, and let's be in such a position where he will say to us when we arrive up there, well done, good and faithful servant. Let us strive for that well done. Yes, do exercise. What's the exercise? Study the scriptures. 
and let's get on and do the work finding the, the lost souls that uh, are needing a savior. So we pray, our God and our Father, we thank you for um, all the word that you've given to us. We thank you for the, the clear description of what is going to take place and for what is not clear, Lord, help us not to be argumentative. And bless us as we see the signs of our Savior soon return. We look forward to his coming again. And to them that look for him, will he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We look for him, Lord. We wait for his coming again. We are listening for the shout. We're listening for the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Help us, Lord, to be ready and help us not to be empty-handed when he comes. Show us who we can bring so that we are not empty-handed when we arrive on the day that the saints come marching in. Bless us, Lord, and be with us in a wonderful way that we may know your hand upon us for good and that we may know your approval here and on that day when our Saviour comes to take us home. Bless us, Lord, and keep us with that day in mind as we do anything and everything with that day in mind, we pray in Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen.